Now we have Gorb Greisen, and who will uh, probably point out all the bad, <laughs> bad results of the project. No. Uh, yes. So Gorb has a very long experience in running a project with NIRS, server oximetry. So it was a pleasure to have uh, him in this project because uh, his uh, critical look uh, can uh, give us uh, the better way to. Uh, to understand uh, how we can improve our device, uh, our technology. So please be, be quiet. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. No, this is, I, I must say this, is, uh, this has been an interesting project because we have been together, those who are um, delivering, those who want to make these beautiful machines, and then us as customers who say, well, uh, we can see it looks beautiful, but uh, um, well, does it work? Does it help? So this is my title, critical evaluation. So first, repeatability. I mean, if you want to measure something, uh, the most important thing is if you can do it and do it again and do it again and get the same result. Because if you get different results every time, then really, um, really, it, it, it ends up having no value. So um, <clears throat> this was how I got into this. This was a PhD student of mine. She was examining the problem. We have a number of, very, of these very preterm infants who are delivered after rupture of membranes. Uh, the uterus is inflamed. There's inflammation there. And we were quite concerned. We know that inflammation is associated with brain injury. And brain injury obviously causes some of these babies to develop cerebral palsy, poor cognitive function. So even among those infants who survive, there is an important problem. And this is the basic really behind the, the, this project. And we know that inflammation is part of this. So what she did was that she looked at these babies and then she had a piece of the umbilical cord and she sent this to the pathologist and they looked whether the leukocytes were in, walking into the tissue as a sign of these leukocytes being inflamed and activated. And the question then was, was there a difference in the brain oxygenation between babies with inflamed and non-inflamed cords? So the problem was you had to compare groups of babies with groups of babies. So it was necessary that each measurement for each baby was as precise as possible. So we knew that this cerebral oximetry measurement is a bit variable, so we just said, let us do many measurements in each child and then take the average. That's what you normally do when you have an imprecise measurement. So she did this, and you can see that every time she takes off, she puts the probe on, she takes it off, she put it back on. Every time it's sitting there, it gives a pretty good stable measurement. But every time she takes it off and put it back, then she gets a slight, slightly different value. And, and this is important because if you come to compare two babies, then you can't put it on the same place. So as soon as you have to, to compare among babies, then you need to know, I mean, what is the kind of precision of, the, of this replacement. And the number here is about 5%. And what does this mean? I mean, it means, for instance, if you put this, such a probe and monitor on the brain of a baby during the first day of life, during intensive care, where we want to sort of protect the brain, and we can do several things to mechanical ventilations, we can manage the blood pressure perhaps, the cardiac function, and we would need to keep the brain out of hypoxia. And this figure show one hour recording and an extremely preterm infant. And you can see the upper trace is uh, tissue oxygenation. This small C there is actually it's a tissue, it's a cerebral oxygenation. And you can see it runs from 70 in the beginning, 70 up here, and then it drops down to 55, and then it increases a bit. And incidentally, this is a mean arterial blood pressure, so it moves with the blood pressure in this particular baby. And here it actually runs under 55, and, and you say this may be the hypoxic period, and the amount of time here is a kind of the burden in this particular infant. But this is obviously necessary that this value then is well defined. and, and and in order for this to be well-defined, the measurement had to be precise. 
And the problem is that that particular instrument, which was one of those which Alessandro showed, has this degree of imprecision, or we have these 95% confidence limit, that means that it's actually possible that the true value is up here. So the curve actually was running like this. And if we had put the sensor somewhere else on the head, the curve would have been running like this. In this case, I mean, this baby was safe. In this case, this baby was in severe problems. So that method really is weak. So for this beautiful instrument you see over there, we, we wanted to sort of do that again. And this was a part of our critical evaluation of this machine. And this is what it looked like. And already here I have some criticism. I mean, uh, this is actually Monica <laughs> who took this photo. I mean. This is a big, heavy piece of something. I mean, we, yeah, it's fine for a sort of a, a dedicated researcher. It will not work with a, a sort of a, a nurse who is busy doing other things. And, and this sort of is a probe, the beautiful probe, which we had to put into a, um, to put in a, into a silicone sleeve because it really couldn't be sterilized, or it couldn't be cleaned properly. And if you move that from baby to baby, it has to be possible to, cle to clean it. So the only reasonable solution to this was to put it into a silicone sleeve. So already here we have a suboptimality. Um, so this is too thick, too stiff, and this obviously is uh, not proper. So that has to be sort of made properly so that can be cleaned in clinical practice or thrown away but I suppose that in here there is for many thousand euros. But, I mean, the results actually were pretty good. So we got optical properties, and this is certainly not my field, but here for the mu A, this is somewhere between 0.1 and perhaps 0.25, and most of them are here, and this is sort of what we'd expect to find from the head of a person and in this case a term, normal term baby after cesarean section. And these are the scattering coefficient and, and we expect these to be lower with, the high, with higher wavelength and again being slightly than, than 10, this is also expected values. So that is fine. And then the, the derived measures here, this is the concentrations of oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin and total hemoglobin. And although I would say we have not so strong ideas in, in normal term infants, I would say these values are pretty reasonable. And uh, the tissue oxygenation here and with a mean of 69, perfect value. And for the blood flow index, I'm not an expert, and this is a relatively strange measure, something with square centimeters per second. This is not a normal measure of, of blood flow. I've been working with blood flow, and we usually do that in milliliters per 100 gram tissue per minute, and, and this cannot be, so this is an index. So for precision or repeatability, this is uh, the same, really the same setup as my former PhD student. Here is a recording. You can see this pretty large short-term variability, which is just a second to second in precision of the instrument, but the mean here over 30 seconds is pretty well defined. I mean, this is obviously random noise. And these means are not so different. This is 7 to 75. And coming out here are the grand average in 17 babies divided between Italy and Copenhagen, uh, Milan and Copenhagen, was 2.7% compared to the 5%. And in none of the subjects, really, it was more than those 5%. So, so this is a very satisfactory result. And I displayed it like this. This is obviously, it's not perfect but it is clearly much better. For the blood flow index, the number you see here, here is 21%. So this is much worse. But fortunately, uh, the, the spontaneous or the natural variability in blood flow is larger, so it may be OK. But um, it is certainly not as promising as this.
So one thing is precise, but the other thing is you like such a measurement to reflect what you think it is measuring, so you want this to be true. Now, truth is a little bit difficult because what is true? But um, you want it to sort of compare and, and, and behave in a way you would expect for the thing you think it is. I mean, so tissue oxygenation should reflect oxygenation, something the balance between on one side delivery of oxygen to the brain and the other side the consumption of oxygen in the brain. So here I'll just show you my sort of um, starting point. These are again from these old instruments with spatially, spatially resolved spectroscopy. Here you have after birth, this means cesarean section because this is an easy concept. You have a baby which is delivered by cesarean section. It's all planned. You know exactly when it happened. You have time to speak to the parents and make arrangement, and then you can be there. And then you can follow the minutes after birth because children are born blue, and then when their lungs open, they will absorb oxygen and they will turn pink. And this sort of blue to pink transition takes some minutes, and that's what you see here. 10 minutes and it starts off with a oxygenation of about 50 and end up in 80. So this is spontaneous and normal and you can say a very easy in principle way of see how instruments react to this. And these two instruments here we compared, we had simply one sitting on one side of the brain and another sitting on the other side of the brain. These two instruments, each of them are sort of fine but they don't agree. So this is what's called a bland altman plot. Uh, here it's a mean value of these two instruments is displayed there, this way. And this is a difference between the two instruments, the reading of the two instruments on this side. And this was 12 babies, I think, me measurement from 12 babies. And around 70, around this, the normal oxygenation, it, it's fine, they agree. But the point here when it runs low, 40, 50, then they disagree very much by 15%. And you could say, who cares if they agree at the normal level because that's just normal. What is important is that they agree at the low level where this becomes an, an interesting and important way to intervene. So this sort of in a very simple way illustrates that, that at least the instruments which are on the market, uh, there is a standardization problem. So in order to explore this, we went into some pretty, in the beginning, pretty primitive experiments. And uh, this was a bucket, as you can see, with different instruments, sensors from different instruments. And here, this is a mixture of water and um, uh, blood, just from a normal donor. We got it in the blood bank, and we add some blood, and then we add some intralipid, which is something you give to babies to feed them. But these are very small lipid, uh, uh, lipid droplets which scatters light. And that's, so that is essentially the scatter. Uh, and we did the change in oxygenation here by a membrane oxygenator. This is a hard lung machine, if you, can, if you can say so. So we could drive the oxygenation up and down in a controlled way and compare the readings from these different instruments. And um, you can see they do differently. This is a deoxygenation curve, three instruments, and they do it differently. So that's sort of re reaffirming that, that this instrument does something differently. So. So there is a standardization problem. And this was in Martin Wolf's laboratory, a better phantom, and more instruments repeating that there is a problem of standardization. So how does baby looks behave? Well, we set out to do the same thing in the after cesarean section. And here, this is one of the first recordings. You see, this is a challenge. You have a perfectly healthy, strong baby, uh, but it is, um, a critical period for the parents, and they are there. And, um, and the baby is um, moving, and it is um, wet, and fair in this, uh, this field wax, so it's also slippery. And you have to do this measurement as fast as possible to catch this sort of oxygenation after birth. And here's one problem. It's difficult to start because uh, this particular machine takes some time to get ready. Um, now, in clinical practice, is that important? Well, often it's not, 
but sometimes doctors are busy or babies are, are unstable and, and therefore in some situation and we like instruments where we can sort of plug it up and get a lamp and get on. Uh, here we have the pulse oximeter, here we have the tissue oxygenation and here we have the blood flow index and I'll just show that uh, this really is not what we expected and I think there is a problem here uh, because uh, you can see the oxygen extraction, the difference between the arterial and the venous or the tissue level here is decreasing. So the brain takes out less oxygen from the blood flowing. But here it says that the blood flow actually decreases. So that means that if you do the computation, that would assume that oxygen metabolism was less here than here. And this is difficult to imagine because this is a healthy baby, a healthy brain, and why should it sort of extract more oxygen here than here? So here I think there is a measurement problem. The, I'll just give this example because we have not through, we're still missing a few of the measurements we were planning to have, and we have not completed the statistics. So I'll just show that the, our purpose here is that we, we, we expected that the cerebral uh, uh, metabolism of oxygen would be fairly stable across this period of time in such healthy babies. So I will move to something which we did to supplement that in the, in the, in the effort of do some critical evaluation of the instrument and this was in piglets and we, in newborn pigs and um, we injected a drug called acetazolamide which, has, which blocks the transport of CO2. And uh, it is widely used in testing uh, brain circulation. And uh, it, what it does is it sort of acts like a heavy dose of CO2. So it increases cerebral, cerebral circulation. And you see that very nicely uh, here in the blood flow index, acetosolamide, and you have this fairly rapid in, and dramatic increase. Uh, you also have more hemoglobin in the brain because the brain vessels dilate. That's very, very predictable. And here you have that the brain turns more pink. That's also predictable. So this looks nice. And again, you have this short-term variability, which is obviously due to photon count limitations and other statistical issues. But, but it seems like the noise here is behaving very nicely. And you get a very nice and relatively smooth trend over, I think, Martina, this is averaged over 30 seconds, isn't it? 10 seconds, this is a 10 second average, moving average. So a pretty, pretty nice signal to noise rate, we can say, for this trend. Uh, and, and this is in a one baby, you can see here the baseline, and here for the blood flow index, blood flow increases. Here this is oxygen extraction, decreases, and the cerebral oxygenation stays pretty stable, showing that these two measures agree because again for acetosolamide we wouldn't expect or rather I'll say we know that cerebral metabolism of oxygen does not change. But when we looked at the six piglets we studied this was not always so nicely so in the, ah, the this, these ones but some of them and here there's a piglet where the cerebral oxygenation index here, the cerebral metabolic rate of it increases by 50 percent so this is really um, a mismatch between these two measures and if you did the statistics I would guess that the estimate the common estimate would be that blood flow in this situation overreacts compared to oxygenation And, and because this was a piglet experiment, we were able to draw some blood. Um, Bjorn, who sit there, put in a, a catheter here, and, and in a piglet you saw you grab the skull and you put the, the catheter into a vein which is sort of draining precisely that part of the brain which is looked at with, um, with um, uh, oximeter. The superior satical sinus. C, uh, sinus. And, and this is simply the superior satical sinus blood here. And during this acetazolamide, these brains get extremely pink. So you have readings here be above 90. And, and this is the baseline values. And at the baseline here, there's a good agreement between the tissue oxygenation here and the, and the cervical sinus. But as the brain gets more pink, it really gets um, under reading. 
And it could be that this is a scalp, because obviously this is sitting on the skin, and there's a skin on the scalp, and, and, and the pink, that's the brain gets pink, but the scalp doesn't get pink. So it may be fine, but it's just not what we think. And here we did, we did, or I did yesterday, the calculation where we sort of adjusted for the fact that the tissue oxygenation is obviously not the venous oxygenation because the light also sees some arteries. And, and in the piglet we have previously looked at this ratio between arterial and venous blood and found it to be uh, one to two. So I did this because we had obviously the measurement from the vein and also from an artery. So we could do this calculation and, and we call this uh, saturation, the co-oximetry reference for oxygen at the tissue level. And here, these low values obviously had to be corrected up because of some arterial blood. So you get this relation where you can say the tilt or the slope is okay, but there is a systematic underreading. And, and this is very fresh in this critical evaluation of the instrument and, and here of, of, of the tissue oxygenation measurement by time resolved spectroscopy and I think we will have to ponder a bit more on yeah in the end a few clinical words on the clinical usefulness I think in clinical practice at two o'clock at night in a hospital with a nurse and a doctor who's not part of in an EU funded trial, then people just want this to work and they want it to work now. So it has to be user friendly. And I'll make a comparison. This is a transcutaneous monitoring of PO2 and CO2. Um, uh, this was mainly driven by a company over the years, a radiometer is sitting in Copenhagen, so I've had some in, uh, interest in this. And, and it's possible to measure oxygen and, and carbon, di carbon dioxide in the skin because we have these capillary loops and, it, and the tissue diffuses through, but the sensor here is pretty complicated, high technology, and these are two, uh, two O-rings which, uh, which sits on a double membrane. So this is a sensitive, a little bit complicated system. And I can just tell you that this company have worked hard on this is a sensor and this is a fixation rings and, and they have worked hard on all this for 25 years and it is still only a partial uptake in the market because it is pretty expensive, it's labor intensive, it is not entirely dependable. Uh, um, yeah, but they earn money, some. So the challenges for baby looks, and Alessandro already mentioned, um, I say there's an eye safety issue. We need to use so much light that we cannot risk that it shines directly in the eye. So we have to have a, a, a way of, of preventing this to shine in the eye. And, and at current, the current probe state, we took the decision that we could not leave it unsupervised. There need to be a person which would take responsibility that it was actually not shining in the eye. And if this is going to be a, a clinically useful routine instrument, this problem has to be solved in a reliable way. Uh, then there's a calibration. At present, the calibration is fine for a researcher, fine for a PhD student, not fine for a nurse in the middle of the night. Um, we need, as Alessandro said, obviously automated real-time output. And there's a probe for monitoring. You know, this stiff and clumsy it has to yeah, be made smoother, uh, more pliable, um, and the probe probably or the fixation of probe to sort of stay still. And then we have been discussing where there could be a, a, um, a, 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 a there could be a point in really developing a sort of a machine which you will, uh, the doctor would pull to the side of the incubator just to put the probe on like we do with ultrasound and then tapping a few knots and then getting a measurement and say, okay, until the nurse turn up or do, do something, I'll be back in an hour. Um, that, and, and there obviously it is important that this would be sort of a, a simple procedure which could be done in a couple of, our most a couple of minutes. Yes. So, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Gorm. I think uh, we have some time for some questions uh, because uh, 
before entering then in the second part with the round table. So if there are some questions, we can, can easily ask. I just would like to start uh, with a comment. So uh, we discuss a lot uh, uh, within the project uh, uh, what to show in this workshop. Uh, uh, I mean, only the good stuff uh, or everything. And we decided for everything. I mean, this is science. Uh, this is also potentially business. Uh, but we want it to be uh, as clear as possible. So uh, there is no, obviously, a, a machine that works perfectly. Uh, we, as, as Gorm has already shown, we had some advantages, uh, some potentiality, but some has already to be uh, investigated and, to, and we need some time. So it takes time, uh, but we can do it. I mean, I think that uh, we have the, the expertise for, for do that. So, uh, and what we have learned uh, is that there is a clear difference, as Gom said, from clinical research and clinical care, which is, uh, I mean, if we can enter the clinical care, then Udo will be very happy because the market uh, uh, explodes. So, uh, probably you can yeah. uh, press the button. Adelina Pellicer from Madrid. Thank you, Gorm, for your introducing me, <laughs> the instrument. As I understood, uh, you, you really improve uh, the measurement of, uh, with this instrument of the tissue oxygen saturation measurement. But the, 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 the way you measure that is time of flight. Uh, I mean, since the beginning, since the 70s, we know that this is the best way to measure that compared to. So my question is, what, with respect to these all instruments, what advantages, apart from the blood flow index, this new instrument has? I mean. I, th <clears throat> I think the potential really is a better precision of the TRS and, and probably also the better accuracy. But perhaps other people in the room can answer this much better. Why there is reasons to believe that the TIS is a more, um, well, this, I mean, based on less assumptions, isn't it? I mean, the, the spatial resolve, which are the instruments we have, which is the spatial resolve is dependent on, on, on the assumption that you have a equal, I mean, that you don't have a heterogeneity in tissue because you're looking at this difference between different distances. So, so you have to assume that the tissue under each of the sensors, each of the sectors are sort of homogeneous. And this homogeneity assumption is not as important. Is that correct? Or what? Yes, not, not no, all. You are the expert here. No. <laughs> there are many experts in this room. So, no, uh, Gorm is right. Uh, probably. It's not only the assumption that the tissue is homogeneous under the sensor, but also that the coupling between the sensor and the tissue is uh, always the same. Uh, and this is something that in TRS uh, is less important. Very So potentially from the point of view of, uh, say, basic physics and technology, TRS is much better. And the same is probably for DCS. I mean, DCS as compared to other methodology for um, assessing blood flow or blood flow index, uh, next time you have to convert the results in, <laughs> in gram per liter, so, uh, it is much better. Uh, actually, I mean, they are, as you said, time of flight TRS is uh, well known since uh, decades, uh, but uh, the point is that since uh, uh, it's only a few years uh, that uh, they are available on uh, compact portable devices, uh, that's the point. Uh, Ten years ago, we can only had the devices in the lab, not in the hospital. And I don't know. I have one question related to what you mentioned, that calibration is necessary or has to be improved. My idea was so far that TRS doesn't need the calibration because it goes through the optical properties and uh, can calculate the STO2 directly. So why is the calibration necessary? <laughs> yeah, sure. No, this is a question of who, who holds the truth. I mean, this is basically a question, what is the gold standard? And I mean, for, I think MRI is an example, or MRI is an example in my world where MRI now is, is have, 
um, got to the level of being the truth. Um, we will be, I mean, in measuring blood flow, there are methods to measure blood flow, and this has achieved more or less a standard within my research community that this is a truth. Now, uh, what I didn't mention is that this piglet experiment, we also did a PET at the same time with water, labeled water. So we have, we are waiting for Björn to compute the PET results so we can compare them to the blood flow index. Uh, because in Copenhagen, at least, we think that PET by labeled water is, uh, we can say, has less assumptions than the MR measurements of, of blood flow. And you could say that, TIS for coming back to this, you could say that this is a truth because you get the optical properties and what you're looking at is a mixture of veins and arteries and every method you could do this, and this can be done by MRI also, Every message has a number of, you can say, limitations and assumptions, and, and, and the truth is an abstraction. It's a latent variable because it is, yeah, what is it? It is, um, it's, I suppose what we would like would be to have the saturation, actually what we would like would be to have the PO2 at the end of the capillary because that is what drives the oxygen diffusion into uh, the tissue and to the mitochondrion and where the... And you know certainly that, that there is also a cytochrome oxidase signal in the, in the near-infrared spectrum. And you could say that the cytochrome oxidase, the enzyme which is sitting at the final use of oxygen, the, the, the reduction of the cytochrome oxidase may be the most biologically interesting, but as I understand this literature, it's a very small signal and it is a great trouble of getting it out. So I'm, I'm Martin Wolf from Zurich. So I'm sure you know this Grubbs paper in, from 1974 where he correlated um, blood flow and total hemoglobin concentration and there is also this Grubbs coefficient so my question would be now you have the means to measure you have the total hemoglobin and you have the blood flow can you really use that equation and then you could in principle say we don't need to measure the flow if we have the total hemoglobin so what is your take on yeah. this no, the, I th thank you for checking this. I, I think this is a very important issue. I mean, just to explain a little bit more, I mean, when the, when the uh, blood circulation dilates as a response to CO2, then the, there's more blood in the vessels and there's also more flow. And, and what this group showed was that there's a mathematical relation between the blood volume and the blood flow. And the blood volume, the, is a, we measure that as a hemoglobin concentration tissue, so could we sort of do a derived. And that has been used by the group in Philadelphia, obviously. Um, as far as I know, this literature, it has been established for CO2-induced flow changes, but it will probably not hold for hypotensive-induced flow changes and, and hypoxia-induced flow changes, and therefore, uh, I, I, I really don't think that this can be uni universal. But thank you for the idea, because certainly we have to see in this acetosolamide studies where we can make it fit. Yeah. Could you know more about <laughs> Last question, because uh, I didn't want to, I mean, anticipate the round table, and then I would like to have some time to do to show the device to the... So. So. Well, I, I wanted to follow up on the grab point. So that has been a very interesting topic over the years of uh, developing DCS and NIRS together and I followed the literature of NIRS and TCD together and then we looked at the MRI data all together and basically as, as Gorm said, devil is in the details. So in the, in the healthy scenario with a CO2 challenge, it tends to work. In the pathological scenario, even if the, the Pathologies in the heart, for example, it seems to fail. Under different conditions, it fails. And this brings to my next, actually, what I wanted to comment to Gorm, because I like to be critical of physiological expectations as well. This is one thing I learned working in this field, is 
Things like anesthesia seems to change physiological expectations. Thing, and therefore, how sure are we when we make these assumptions to measure um, accuracy when we assume that we know, for example, that CMRO2 shouldn't change? Are there better ways to measure our accuracy that we can think in these babies? And I'm not aware of it, actually. You mentioned MRI, for example, and I know people try to sometimes calibrate MRI using our techniques, and we like to use MRI to calibrate our techniques. So how can we be sure about this accuracy without making assumptions that CMRO2 doesn't change? This is biology, after all.